Hi, it's Chris. So as I told you today, we're gonna enter a telescope land, but unfortunately we still have some theory parts ahead of us. These are important chapters we will cover, and if you want to buy a scope, it's necessary to know some basic rules about classification and properties. Many people out there just want to sell their crap, really. So, if you enter a merchandise or a drugstore, sometimes you can find a cheap scope like 20 to 50 bucks, with labels on it saying now massive 300 times magnification and of course beautiful renderings of fine deep space objects. <laughs> and just let's be clear, magnification is not a characteristic quality of a scope itself. In this case it's just a marketing trick. The question for us then is, what is the characteristic quality of a scope? First and foremost, the scope is defined by its focal length. The focal length, often referred to by FL, is the distance from the main optical element, like the main lens, to the focal point, like the burn point where you can center all of the sun's light on one spot and burn wood or stuff. The focal length is measured in millimeters or sometimes centimeters here in Europe, and it's most familiar to most people when used for lenses, say DSLR lenses. The range of focal lengths reaches from nearly zero for fisheye lenses to 50 millimeters for DSLR kit lenses, to up to 200 millimeters for zoom lenses. And there we enter the, say, field of short focal length scopes. There is no general definition, but I would call a scope with 300 millimeter focal length short. And that's what I did in the first videos. What I meant was the focal length. Up we go and there we are with the intermediate focal lengths from, let's say, 400 to 700, 800 millimeter. Again, no real definition here, but you see as the distance lens focal point grows, so does the scope in its length. And um, even higher, 800 and above, reaching even up to several meters. These are the long focal lengths. This is what I meant when I said long scopes back a few videos ago. You also might have recognized with ever increasing focal lengths, the mounts increased also in robustness. A very, very important point and we will come back to this again and again. So this is the focal length and it defines an important property, the field of view. The field of view, short FOV, is the area we can observe with a given optical system. In astronomy and everywhere else, it's often measured in degrees. 360 times 360 is the entire sky. We humans tend to have a 210 times 150 degrees FOV, so says Wikipedia, and one degree times one degree is a tiny patch of, say, the sky. So the FOV gives us the area of what we can see, and this is very, yes, very important. For visual astronomy, we actually can use something like magnification, more in a sec. But just because we can compare it with the 210 times 150 degrees FOV of the human eye. But for astrophotography, what do you refer to? So there is no such thing as magnification in astrophotography because it lacks a reference point. And even in visual astronomy, all that matters is the patch you can observe. And that's your FOV. The link between focal length and FOV is simple as that. The longer the focal length, the narrower the field of view. The shorter the focal length, the wider the field of view. So a short scope will give you access to a wide patch of the sky, say parts of the Milky Way, and a very long one will only cover the area of a small distant galaxy or so. You can visualize this with the toilet roll model, <laughs> I tell you, it's just a model, nothing like science-based stuff. You simply take a short center of a toilet roll, like that, and then you peer through it, and you see a given patch of your surrounding, and then you take a long roll, like this one, and peer through. See? It gives you a narrower patch of your vision. That's the same with telescopes. And now let's bog rolls be bog rolls. When it comes to astrophotography, there is a second and very important factor for the FOV, and this is the chip size. In an optical system, if you decrease the chip size, you are decreasing the part of the sky you can see. So the FOV of a long scope with a very big sensor might actually be the same like with a short scope and a very tiny sensor. 
because you just increase the given patch of sky with the short focal length, but then you cut major pieces out with your small sensor. So you end up with two images covering the very same patch of the sky. And when buying scopes, never go with the more focal length the better. Most times it's the reverse. Short focal length scopes are more easy, more stable, more intuitive, less fiddling, opens a wide part of the sky, often necessary to capture big nebulas. Remember, every target has its own favorite scope, never forget that. So that was one property of scopes, the focal length. The second one is the aperture. This term is more straightforward. The aperture is the diameter of the main optical part, say the lens or the main mirror. It's given in millimeters or why ever one should leave the sweet, sweet, beautiful metrical world in inches. The aperture dictates i.e. the amount of light that can possibly pass through the main optical part and be the upper limit of your optical resolution. More in a sec. The range is from um, nearly zero, no kidding, let's say five millimeters in smartphones and the human eye. Then we increase the aperture and in the range of 50 millimeters we find the so-called finder scopes. These are scopes sitting on top of scopes and you use them to get an overview and find targets, hence the name, whatever. Slightly above, say in the range of 50 to 80 millimeters, we find the guide scopes. Those scopes are equipped with a camera to, let's say, stabilize the tracking of the night sky. There are finder scopes used as guide scopes, the borders are floating here. Going up and we enter the world of small refractors, so scopes with a lens. Around 80 mm aperture and typically 400 to 500 mm focal length. Most people say these are the best beginner scopes. We discuss this later on. But of course you can use a small refractor as a guide scope, again there is no real definition. The bigger refractors come in the range of up to 100, even 120 mm aperture. These scopes are heavy monsters now. The big main lens is getting exponentially expensive. There are monster lens scopes up to 150 mm aperture and even some above. But those scopes are massive, heavy and very expensive. There is an upper limit for lenses, as they start to bend and break under their own weight. And so from here on you're gonna see mirror scopes. Smaller ones start on the range of 100 mm aperture. My old Newtonian is actually 75 mm. And then reaching up to 200 mm and way above. Say in inches, 4 inch is a baby reflector. With 6 inch starts the world, they say. The 8 inch are more powerful and 10, 12 or even 14 inch, they are massive beasts. As with increasing apertures, the mirrors and scopes are getting heavy too. From here on you often see Dobsonian scopes. They are mounted onto a like very robust turning table, more later. The focal length dictated us the field of view, and so what does the aperture gives us? We can focus on two main points. A. The bigger the aperture, the more light will enter the scope. So for fainter objects you need more light. In this case, the bigger the better. Important fact here, if you double the aperture, you actually quadruple the area of your optical component, and uh, thus the amount of light you collect. It's the square rule. And secondly, B. The bigger the aperture, the better is the optical resolution. The optical resolution is the ability to distinguish two items in the sky that are very close together. This seems to be one blobby blob. But if we increase the optical resolution, we get the feeling that it has a middle structure. Even better resolution and we start to guess it might be even two objects. And going up it turns out we are right. These are two distinct objects. See, this is the globular cluster M13 with my 6 inch scope. You see some star separation in the middle. So now, this is Hubble with its 2.5 meter mirror. See, <laughs> the stars are resolved much better, no joke. And this is the impression of Saturn through a 50 mm guide scope. This is Saturn with my 150mm Newtonian scope, even though this is not the best image one can achieve with this scope. And this is Hubble image from Saturn with its 2.5m primary mirror. 
So for a given aperture, there is a limit of what you can achieve. We're going to talk about that when we cover eyepieces and magnification limits in a future video. These two points are given by the aperture, light gathering and optical resolution. And so, after all this, if you see a scope like this in your local drugstore, run and hide, you can't expect anything from this. More importantly, never give something like this as a present for kids, you're gonna ruin their ambition for this wonderful hobby. But if you see something like this, scope specification, focal length of 700mm and aperture of 76mm, Newtonian style telescope, that's cool. That, and the price and the brand, is the most relevant information for you. That scope commercial seems more reliable. Because now you know, the focal length tells you something about the area of the sky that is in the reach of the scope and the aperture gives you information about the light gathering capabilities and the resolution. In the next video we will bring the two units together and we will discover fast and slow scopes, really. So I hope this gave you something like a first glimpse on the relevant specifications of a scope. More are to come. And if you like this video and don't want to miss the slow scopes, hit like and subscribe. And as always, if you know others starting out right now, point them here. One more word. If you haven't purchased a scope yet, don't hurry. Take a pair of binoculars and just gaze the stars. That's so relaxing and something to slow down. Appreciate the beauty. Things will get messy and tricky when the scope arrives, so take your time now. And as always, I say clear skies to everyone, until next time here on Catching Photons.